levels are twice that of D.C. Oil pollution has poisoned water for scores of miles in Prudhoe Bay, leaching into the rivers and into the oceans. I found oil spills throughout the tundra, as shown here. The oil industry reports more than 400 oil spills a year around Prudhoe Bay, more than one a day. These have very toxic substances and known carcinogens. Tire tracks mar the tundra and will last for decades. The poisonous oil spills with toxins such as benzene, toluene, chromium, and arsenic will poison life for centuries. With only 10 days of food for my 90-day trip, I was dependent upon the land for the bulk of my food. My goal was primarily to eat fish as well as roots, berries, and grains. But the oil industry had decimated the fisheries by dredging for gravel in the rivers and streams and with oil pollution. I was unable to catch fish until I got far from the industrial destruction. So I turned my attention to edible plants, like this woolly lousewort, favorite food of moose, caribou, muskox, and grizzly bears. I dug the roots out of the tundra. I washed the roots and boiled them for half an hour to make stews. This was not the most flavorful of food and also did not provide adequate calories for carrying a 90 pound pack. But try as I could, I could not lure a bite in fishless, polluted waters thanks to the oil industry. The oil industry wants to extend their pipeline east into the last 5% of undeveloped coastal plain of Alaska into the Arctic Refuge. I backpacked along where they want to extend this pipeline across the open tundra. With the excessive weight in the pack, it was a very difficult task to trek across the boggy tundra. My feet were constantly wet and I gave up on trying to keep my boots dry. The tundra has tussocks, or clumps of vegetation, that make hiking exceedingly difficult, being four to six times slower and harder to hike across than walking along the road. The oil industry littered barrels for scores of miles from Prudhoe Bay, along with styrofoam pipe fittings, plastic waste, and other trash. Even 60 miles from Prudhoe Bay, I was still finding barrels. Many barrels were part full of toxic waste just oozing into the tundra. I was exceedingly hungry as I approached the Canning River, border of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. The Canning River is a barrier to oil development because the coastal plain of the Arctic Refuge is off limits to oil development. But all that could change with an act of Congress. At the Canning, I finally began to catch fish. I hiked up river toward the Brooks mountain range. My feet were covered with blisters from hiking through the wetland tundra. Deep pools of the Canning River allowed me to catch many grayling which I desperately needed for food. This is a grayling pictured here. They could be more than 20 years old and grow very slowly in the far north. While very sensitive to overfishing, because I was moving every day, my impact was spread out. It is the pollution from oil development and the dredging of gravel by the industry that most threatens the grayling, as well as other wildlife in this last intact Arctic ecosystem. Along the protected river, I recovered from the intense hunger of hiking through oil industry decimated lands. The Canning River is braided across dozens of gravel channels. Deep pools like this are uncommon but make excellent fishing holes. I caught eight grayling and packed the meat I could not eat with me, making me grizzly bear bait. I stored my fish far from my tent, using a boot as a marker so I could find it and find them in the morning. I pulled up the tussock so I could store the meat on the permafrost, or permanently frozen ground, just a foot deep. Along the canning, I came across this stand of alder trees which are far north of the tree line and an indication of global warming. I crossed the Canning River and waded through thick willows and tussocks to reach Eagle Creek and the valley I would take through some of the highest mountains in the Brooks Range. Here in the protected Arctic refuge, 
Water was crystal clear, which I drank without any need of filtration. Eagle Creek was mostly too shallow to fish, but did afford expansive views of the mountains. I marked the position of my heavy pack with compass points to various mountain peaks before setting out with my fishing rod to a lake where I hoped to catch fish. While it looked like a pond from the distance, this lake is more than a mile across. While I was unable to catch fish, the beauty of this lake at 1 a.m. was breathtaking. I stayed for many hours, enjoying the early morning tranquility. Eagle Creek made for easy hiking along its gravel shores, but I had to cross the water regularly, keeping my feet soaking wet. I dug up a bear root, which I spent more than an hour working to identify because it is very similar to a poisonous plant. I was able to catch a few grayling in a pool, which I cooked along with a pot of rice. I mixed the fish and the oil used to cook it into the rice, making what I called my wilderness stew, a dish I never tired of. Rainbows are common in the Arctic, with the low angle of the sun. I found some grayling trapped in this pool, which I caught using my mosquito netting anchored to the bottom with rocks, the netting floated, and chased the grayling back and forth with my paddle until they swam into it. I enjoyed them as rainbows drifted down the valley. These would be the last fish for a while as I headed across some of the highest mountains toward Lake Schrader. I burned the ends off caribou antlers to make splints from a pack that had broken into two pieces from the excessive weight. I went south up Straight Creek. Then I turned up an unnamed creek that rose steeply into the mountains. I shared the narrow valley bottom with a rampaging and quite cold creek. I came upon a waterfall and had to turn back to find another pass over the mountains. I went up the steep tundra pass. This is looking back over the mountains I had just climbed through. I went down to the saddle ridge and valley then up and over another pass to Spawning Creek, which led to Lake Schrader and these cabins. I caught Lake Trout just 30 feet from the cabin door. Having been with little food for nearly a month, I was relieved to have such big fish so easy to catch. Lake Trout only live in extremely clear water and are very sensitive to warm temperatures that climate change is expected to bring. Rainbows drifted over the lake while I caught and gorged on fish. Winds blew my raft against the shore, and I had to pull it with a line attached to my paddle. This was slow, tedious to travel, but still easier than backpacking. With winds making it impossible to travel farther, I set up camp. This was 1 a.m. on my 21st birthday. After a good night's sleep, I had a perfect birthday present with winds going in just the right direction. I could just lie back and let the winds do the work for a change. With my fishing line out, I caught this Arctic char. Arctic char breed in these lakes, then grow to be up to 10 years old and 15 inches long before swimming to the ocean in June to feed. Each fall, the char will swim back up the rivers to spend their winters in fresh water. This is a larger char that I caught later in the journey. Arctic char are sensitive to oil development, which would cross most of the major tributaries that they use in the Arctic refuge, as you can see from this map. In the background is Mount Chamberlain, with the Chamberlain Glacier encrusted in its peak. Like all of the 144 glaciers in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, it is receding quickly as a sign of global warming. At the corner of Lake Strader, where the Kakiktuk River flows down toward the Arctic Ocean, I met the first people I'd seen in 26 days. I set up